I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Mark Moffat. He's an ecologist and author of several books, including Adventures Among Ants and, more recently, The Human Swarm. Mark, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. All right, Adam. Great to be here. You spent a long time studying ants. Usually that's like a phase that kids go through. You, you have your magnifying glass and then, well, how, how did that turn into a whole career? Uh, you know, I was... I was uh, listening to uh, your talk with Abigail Marsh, and she uh, was talking about entomologists and their narrow focus and whatnot. No, 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 not with ants. Uh, she's She's got to talk to me a little more. Ants give you everything. You know, I studied ants when I was in diapers, meaning young, uh -huh. and, uh, you know, two months old down in the dirt. And I always tell people, you know, everybody studies ants when they're an infant. Uh, mm -hmm. And I showed commitment. You know, I stuck with it. Everybody else. Yeah. What What is it about yeah. most people that gets us out of that phase? Well, we're told to grow up, and uh, you know, when we grow up, and literally growing up means growing farther from the ants because they're down below. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe we become too far sighted, and being near sighted, uh, uh, philosophically and uh, in terms of my eyes, uh, ants have always kept uh, my attention. You know, and I, the reason we watched dance when we were little is that they intrigued us for particular reasons that are important. Ants are not just running around at random. They're, they're making infrastructure, highways. They have highway rules. There are all kinds of teamwork involved. They're working together to get food back to the nest, and they're building that nest, and they're cooperating in all kinds of fancy ways. They have assembly lines, they have agriculture, they have mass warfare. We're seeing ants fight even as infants, right? It was a, a young boy in uh, Great Britain who, who found out that the pavement ants that we have even around here, they're an import, uh, they were thought to be like playing uh, on the sidewalks. You see piles of them in the spring in Cambridge or down here in New York. Uh, it turns out that they're fighting. This this is a boy that figured this out. He figured out that they were not playing. They were tearing each other apart. So it pays to be a have a youthful mind, I think, in studying anything. Mm -hmm. And ants ants provide me with the most useful uh, useful and youthful mind possible because it brings me back to my days as a a child, uh, feeling a wonder in the world and actually finding out things that are useful from these little creatures. I can certainly tell, and I wouldn't think that I would be this excited to talk about ants, but it, it is amazing when you think about it, that you get some such complex behavior out of basically no brains. And I think uh, ants are actually something that psychologists should study more because the trouble with studying people is we mess up our, our, our social lives, our sociology is all messed up by these complex relationships that really don't get jobs done. You know, we're we've got hierarchies and we're constantly doing all kinds of bullshit with each other. Uh, ants just do it. Ants build a society. They build the road. There's no discussion about it. They do it in effective ways. Uh, so ants are societies without the psychology baggage that confuses uh, sociologists with, uh, with uh, psychology. Those disciplines get messed together. Ants just are, are, are the pure so, social animals in that sense. And mm -hmm. I think uh, that makes them really useful as well. You know, I've heard a lot about E.O. Wilson's sociobiology, and I've never read the primary source, but this he, he studied ants at first as well, right? And was talking about social behavior and this kind of led downstream into evolutionary psychology as we know it today. Yeah, it did. And uh, he, uh, he put a lot of things forward at first. He got uh, in lots of controversies about it for doing so. Uh, and Can you he, give us an overview of what what he was arguing for? Well, he was arguing. For, he was looking at the evolution of social behavior in a broad sense, building up to humans and issues around uh, how these things happen. He was interested in kin theory that was coming forward. Uh, ideas about group selection. He later uh, changed over to think more about group selection and so forth. He, uh, he he went into a lot of different things about human behavior, and 
I think he caused, uh, he was my hero. I get his uh, book, The Insect Societies, when I was in junior high school, three books for a dollar from the uh, science, fiction, uh, science book club. And so I wanted to work with him. I didn't know that Harvard was a, a, a place full of fantastic egos. Uh, you know, I won't mention them but right there, but you know, I, I got to visit Harvard and I ta uh, tapped on his door and he opened the door and I gave him a big double handshake and called him Ed, even though I was just an undergraduate. And I learned later I was supposed to call him Dr. Wilson, but I had already studied, uh, started talking about him as Ed, so I stuck with it. And he was a Southern gentleman, totally uh, charming and understated and thoughtful. Um, I do think he went uh, astray a bit in terms of convincing psychologists and sociologists in his point of view because he he had a perspective that biology would incorporate your subjects into bio, uh, into itself you know uh, i see more of a two-way street i'm learning so much from psychologists that can apply to biology and so that's what really fascinates me is this interface between the two it seems to me the the, the real creative areas uh in every generation are, are the intersections of di different disciplines that have always been kept apart and i think <laughs> psychology and biology have a lot to offer each other in both directions so sometimes you hear about this idea of maybe math is the most pure science and then physics is something like applied math and chemistry is like applied physics and biology is applied chemistry and uh psychology is applied biology and sociology is applied psychology like all of this nesting do you think that's the right way to look at it uh adam it's not a particularly the way i look at it i mean there's too much emergent complexity going mm -hmm. on in biology to uh understand the world uh, thinking of it that way maybe with our vast data sets we can eventually think of it that way but even so i think in terms of uh talking with it and understand uh, talking about it amongst ourselves and understanding it in the, in the human mind we have to uh treat each discipline uh, as its own thing to some extent and feed off of what we can learn from the other disciplines. I don't uh, particularly see this as a kind of a hierarchy or anything like that, I guess. Mm -hmm. What's an example of the the reverse direction? So in influences of psychology on biology? Well, I'm really interested in social identity and uh, uh, how individuals come to treat each other as in-group and out-group those kind of basic questions. Uh, one thing that Ed, Ed Wilson uh, missed in sociobiology and his other books, he had um, a lot of discussions of societies and most people still do, but they're not actually talking about societies. They're talking about social behavior in a general sense. What I'm really interested in is uh, groups, well-defined groups that last through the generations, uh, things like a nation, uh, where you have an in-group and an out-group that's an enduring kind of boundary. And those are the things that uh, are more central to the thinking of social psychologists. Uh, adding to that the idea of these being enduring, uh, we think of our nations extending back in uh, history more than they do, and the fact that we think they'll continue into the future. In any case, those perspectives on uh, how what societies are and how they're maintained are, are things that I think are interesting across the animal kingdom. So Ed never talked about societies. He mentioned things that are relevant to societies in a, a couple of places in his book, but he never really identified what a society was. He talked about um, cooperation as a cooperative group, but uh, you know, I look around America today and go like, no, we're not cooperative particularly. We have a lot of cooperation within our society, but we also cooperate across societies and so forth. Mm -hmm. You can't define or distinguish societies by cooperation. You have to, I think, most usefully distinguish them in terms of these boundaries, in-group and out-group, and mm -hmm. see how cooperation emerges within societies and between societies. And uh, so that's building upon uh, what I would consider a psychological po psychologist point of view, social psychologist point of view of identity and twisting it in different ways to look at different animals. But, you know, 
currently I'm looking at societies of quite a variety of species. I've just come back from Australia where I was studying a lizard that comes closest of any reptile to having a society. Multiple generations of this species stay together and defend a territory. Uh, mm -hmm. So there can be, a, and the native, the, the, the lizards in the next society over are uh, quite rambunctious and they will sneak over and try to eat the young of their society. Wow. So they actually do have to protect themselves. There's a definite in-group and out-group going on there. It's, uh, it's not quite warfare, but the, the uh, people studying these lizards ca call their societies a fury because there's so much, uh, well, anger among those little lizards about each other. So they're wow. constantly at, e at odds with each other. In, in neuroscience, when you talk about limbic brain regions, the more ancient ones which govern emotions like anger. So you sometimes use the term lizard brain. So I guess that maps on very directly. I think that's just horrible. I think <laughs> brains are the highest developed brains of all time. Even Darwin was impressed by the fact that you can get 250,000 neurons to do so much. He wrote about mm -hmm. ant brains being so awesome so you know don't downplay the animal kingdom too much oh not not downplaying at all because i guess the most ancient ones are also in a, in a very real sense the most fundamental they have a larger sway on us than the top down type stuff well yeah that's very true okay adam i'll accept you now, that point of view good so i've, I've certainly heard of this in-group out-group warfare in chimps and other primates uh I, I didn't know that it existed in simpler animals why do you think that that isn't as publicly aware. Uh, well, you know, uh, warfare as such, and by warfare, I mean uh, uh, mass engagements of group against group where both sides face wholesale destruction. The word warfare is used all over the place to get public publicity for different uh, studies. And it's sometimes just a murder or something. No, it's gotta be this mass uh, uh, engagement to, between entire groups. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of different creatures uh, with societies have some kind of warfare, but the, you know, the, the pinnacle of warfare is in the ant, you know, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. That's what King mm -hmm. Solomon says in the Bible. Apparently he probably didn't mean ant warfare. He meant probably other things about ants. Uh, but ants, I describe as entirely nationalistic. They are totally focused. All those little ant brains are totally focused at the so society level, the colony level, uh, and anybody outside is an enemy. So uh, ants never have alliances between colonies of the same species. They're either in attack mode or running away to try to protect yourself mode. Um, I know in some animals you can detect kin through smell, and it might be the smell or some hormonal trigger that cues whether you're going to view this as friend or foe. Do ants have a system like that? Well, the assumption had been for a long time that it was about kinship. Uh, and kinship, I think, has been overemphasized by anthropologists and biologists uh, because societies exist across all kinds of species that include kin, but even these lizards will sometimes let in outsiders, uh, and those outsiders are then treated as full members. And it's true for wolf packs, which are sometimes called family groups, and they're, they're a dominant pair that reproduces in their offspring, but they can have several individuals that they've let in and become full members of the society. And at the other extreme, you can have species like horses where no member of the society is member, uh, related to anybody else. These are young horses that get together and form a compact, well-structured group and protect each other for life. Uh, so you can get a variety, quite a variety of things that don't have to do with kinship being very effective societies. So even in the ant, which it appears to be a kin group for virtually all species because there's a mother that's the queen and her offspring, her daughters. Uh, there are still species with very large colonies where there's zero relatedness in the colony. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. most fabulous is the Argentine ant, which has colonies of millions and even billions. And we can talk about them. The fact that they remain united, even though there are millions of queens among them, 
And uh, there's a genetic, genetic variation all over the place among this vast population from place to place. And yet they remain absolutely united. How, how does this work? How do you keep track of literally millions of insects? Are you doing DNA testing on samples of them and then using fancy statistics to generalize to a bigger population? Well, I was just winding around what you uh, what I should have led to from your last question, and that is that ants have uh, a signal uh, that indicates their identity. It's basically their national flag. It's on their body surface. It's a, uh, a number of hydrocarbons that they smell on each other. So it's a scent and young ants learn that when they emerge from the pupae, they learn that for the colony and uh, they uh, adhere to that identity for the rest of their lives. But there's, there's more interesting uh, things going on than you'd think because the colony identity can shift over time and the ants have to creep, keep re readjusting their knowledge about what it is. There are examples that I could give for that. So it's ants are learning a lot and keeping track of each other within that colony. And for that colony to grow large, all they have to do is make sure that the national flag applies uh, from that small size up to whatever size it wants to reach. You have to have a consistent sense of identity. And uh, that colony of the, uh, the colonies of the Argentine ant, which get huge and cover hundreds of square miles in California, uh, have a signal that applies throughout huge areas. So you can take an Argentine ant from San Francisco and drive it all the way down to the Mexican border uh, and drop it off right where the customs officers are, are looking at the passports of Americans trying to go back and forth or Mexicans going back and forth between the countries. And the ant is still fine there. It just merges with the other ants because they all still have the same national identity there. But if you take uh -huh. that same ant to Escondido County and move and carry it across a borderline that you can't see, but the ants judge with their lives, it's dead within minute, a minute or two. Because dead because other ants kill it, or it's just across, there's a borderline where two of these immense colonies meet. And these are the largest battles ever recorded for anybody. Oh, they beat humans so many, many fold because probably a million ants are dying along battlefronts that extend through miles in Escondido County. Uh, and it's a very distinct borderline and the ants register it because on the other side of the border, there's a different national flag. And so this was very confusing to the researchers studying ants because to them, they look around and Southern California is this vast sea of ants and it looked like, how could all these colonies be getting along? But they always were one colony. They, mm -hmm. These ants got to Southern California uh, on the train. We know when they arrived and uh, they spread out from there. And it turned out uh, over time, four different colonies arrived. The four colonies have taken over Southern California. Three of them are pretty small. The, the fourth uh, is enormous, probably a trillion ants in it. And uh, those ants spread from each colony outward and outward and outward and kept their identity as they went. And so the, the question becomes similar to what we see in humans. If uh, aliens landed in China uh, 15,000 years ago, they'd see all these little hunter-gatherer groups and you come back today and there's like, a billion people in one group. Mm -hmm. Did something change? Well, I think the parsimonious answer is maybe not. Maybe are those rules of identity were there at the beginning for the ants in their small, what was initially a small colony and for humans initially. Uh, and those rules allowed uh, both species to create huge societies. Mm -hmm. And there, there are similarities to the rules. Ants have a very stripped down way of doing it, but humans as well have all kinds of identity cues that we knew we use to be comfortable with each other. Uh, and I talk about us having uh, a, uh, a billboard of our identity built into our bodies. So we're taking each other in, as you probably know, at lightning speed and the uh, click of a, uh, well, the blink of an eye, that's the best mm -hmm. way of putting it and uh, recognizing who we're comfortable with and who we're not comfortable with 
And as long as those rules of engagement stay steady enough, a group of humans can keep growing and growing and growing. Those rules were present in hunter gatherers. Mm -hmm. What is it that makes these ants not considered different species if they can't interact with each other whatsoever? Well, no ant colonies interact. Even if it's a colony of four ants, there's one species with just four up to four ants in a colony, and they never interact. As I say, they're nationalists, so they they mm -hmm. don't they don't uh, they don't find ways of having peace. Uh, but of course, the to breed a new colony, you have uh, males fly up from one colony and females from another colony mate, and that female starts a new colony from scratch. And she, her colony won't re interact with any of the others. But, you know, it's this moment of breeding, in this case, with uh, sexual reproduction in flight with the, uh, starting a colony de novo every generation. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, and, and as I say, ants don't get along. Other species do. The wonders about humans is we do get along across our societies. Bono uh, chimpanzees don't. Bonobos do. These are differences from species to species. I, I only know a little bit of the history here secondhand from fr reading Franz de Waal, but I re remember he recounted that maybe early 1900s or so when evolutionary theory was just really taking off and being widely accepted, there was a story about mankind being like a killer species, like our early hominin ancestors were the ones to dominate and kill and that's how and it was like hardcore survival of the fittest and that cooperation among early humans was really overlooked and seen as something only to emerge much later and then it, it sounds like DeWall is arguing no even even in chimpanzees and even in bonobos like cooperation and empathy and things like this go way back yeah no they do chimpanzees uh seem to have much less of it Mm -hmm. uh, there are moments where chimpanzees can get together from different societies. It's the moment is when a female chimp sneaks out of her territory to meet with another female chimp she was a friend with in her youth because the females and the part of the growing up in a chimpanzee society is the female switch societies. So she becomes part of another society and she identifies with the society, but she tells individual friends in the other group. Now they have to hide this. They can't do this in front of anybody because their uh, fellow citizens for their community would kill their friend. So this is the only instance I know of chimpanzees getting along. The other truth though about chimpanzees as bonobos is that the belief is that bonobos are, can be quite friendly to other societies because they don't need to compete very much. They have a, a lot of resources around. So the interesting question becomes, what would happen to bonobos if there were less resources? And they lived in an environment like the chimpanzees where they simply couldn't get enough resources. So it may be that both species are capable of a range of behaviors. Excuse my alarm. There must be something happening. Uh, of a range of behaviors, and we just have an, uh, uh, found that those uh, environments yet where you can have an unfriendly bonobo and a friendly chimpanzee. Uh, there are suspicions that, that bonobos occasionally kill each other. And there's also cases where individual communities of bonobos, and of course uh, by bonobos, I mean the, the uh, uh, sister species of chimpanzees, the species that is a, a apparently much more friendly and much more female oriented than the chimpanzee, which is more warlike, as you put it. And uh, but there are instances of bonobo communities that have never been seen together. So there may be cases where bonobos don't get along either. So I could think of two extremely different ways to tell this story. This would be an extreme nature nurture debate. So one would be that genetically chimpanzees and bonobos are almost identical and it, the hard wiring is all there. And if you place a bonobo in a chimp-like environment or a chimp in a bonobo-like environment, you'll see the behavior switch. And then the other story, the more nature heavy one would be something like it took many thousands or millions of years for the more aggression or more peaceful behavior to evolve. Wh which one of those seems more likely? Yeah. Oh, I, 
I don't know, but I, I think the first one is the one that isn't talked about enough, the possibility of behavioral flexibility, because it, it's true of us as well. We can be quite warlike and quite peaceful depending on how much competition is going on, how fearful we are. I mean, that's a everyday thing when we see the news, when people's uh, anxiety is up, uh, they're more fearful and less open to immigrants coming into the society and they're more open to aggression t between societies and so forth. It seems this flexibility is there. We have to figure out how to modulate it so that we don't harm each other. But I wouldn't be, I, it would surprise me if that flexibility wasn't present to some degree in both the bonobo and the chimpanzee. Clearly though, the chimpanzee does err on the side of a lot of aggression and the bonobo uh, has much more option in the way of options to be uh -huh. pleasant towards outsiders. And we humans seem to fall somewhere in between. Correct. And uh, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing, right? That we can actually uh, not only become friends with foreigners, our minds still treat them as foreign. You, should, you know, as a psych, as, as psychology research shows that we, we still recognize their foreignness, but they can be our best friends. And we can go beyond that. That's what bonobos do and actually you know, coordinate and cooperate to do all kinds of actions and uh, do all kinds of things together. Uh, and that's, you know, it's extraordinary, really. It's just amazing that humans succeeded at any of this stuff, frankly. Mm -hmm. From studying ants, I'm going like, wow, good for you, human beings. I can't, don't know how you do it. Do we have higher order cognition, the, the capacity for abstract thinking. And one form of that is the way we conceive of identity. So maybe there's a natural way of looking at your immediate kin or tribe or society. In the modern world, when we're so uh, globally interconnected, I, I don't know if that applies so much, but there's this idea of if you think enough, you can sort of move up the hierarchy of inclusivity. So if you're very narrow, you might only focus on your immediate group, but you, nationalism, like across all races, could be uh, more inclusive, even more so than that could be something like religious identity, where maybe across many different uh, countries or nationalities and races, you have this overarching theme. And then the, the universal one would be something like a universal humanism. And you see this in, uh, in Independence Day, like the idea that if aliens came down and suddenly it forces us to recognize that we humans have to stick together as opposed to focusing on these more um, minute divisions. Do you, do you think that that's an accurate take, that there's, there's a psychologization of group identity that can be moved up or down this hierarchy? Uh, well, the actual identity doesn't move. This is the problem. Mm -hmm. The identity doesn't move. So when the Aborigines first saw uh europeans with their boats they thought there were ghosts they were like these super pale weird things they were terrified they were shooting them uh they banded together but that doesn't mean there's there there are different groups the ethno-linguistic groups as they call them disappeared they were always there so it's important to realize that those groups give us meaning and validation. They're going to be there. We're always going to have a pride in a country and maybe in an ethnicity if we live within an ethnic group within a country. Uh, those groups are not going to go away and they are can be positive things. So, I mean, there are lots of negatives about uh, stereotyping and so forth, but we're not going to give those groups up. Those nations and so forth uh, whatever forms societies take in humans are going to remain. The possibility of having a more inclusive uh, identity and unity around uh, issues is an important one, though, and that's what you're talking about. But to have a cos this idea of cosmopolitanism, a universal society, just doesn't work unless there are space aliens, right? And the space right. aliens be a point of uh, reference from outside because people have in groups and out groups we're built to do that it's it's uh it's not something we can lose and in fact if you you know the uh the uh, whole issue becomes tricky because if you tell people that they have 
a bias and they don't want to believe it. And they, people tend to overcompensate or make things worse by trying to like uh, deal with their biases. This is a, a finding of Mazarin Banaji and others. So, you know, it's actually kind of tricky uh, to imagine getting rid of these biases. They're there. But I look at what you're saying and and say, yes, there's a there's a value to having this more inclusive point of view. And uh, uh, the difficulty, of course, now is that uh, this inclusivity is being short circuited by all the uh, information we have, because even though we have uh, pretty close contact potentially with anyone on the earth with the web now, of course, the web itself is dividing us into subgroups that could never have existed before because people with bizarre points of view can find each other and form even tighter groups. So right now it's a, a tricky thing. I'm just trying to solve the problems of ants. And so I, yeah. I will the rest of it. Now, to in, you. So in, in very tribalistic species, and, and maybe we can focus on ants for now, is there something like when there's a higher order threat, you forget about the tribalism? Like, let's say there's an exterminator right at the border and it's it's spraying gas in a certain direction and like the ants are fleeing from the gas i don't know if this is realistic at all but would they would they stop warring with each other as they're fleeing and they're like we all we're all ants we got to escape the human invader it's kind of like the aliens idea uh no ants ants uh, would sort that out no they wouldn't they would uh yeah no they wouldn't sort that one out uh, if we move if we move closer to humans then it, is there any evidence that chimpanzees in different groups who might normally be at war with each other, if, if there's like an, another predator in the area, would they then band together against that? Is that? See, that's an interesting hypothesis. It would be hard to, to do an experiment of that sort. Maybe there are two communities of chimpanzees in some zoo that could be put together to see if they could ever cooperate. Uh, that's really what Franz de Waal should do to, to really, uh, uh, get to the crux of the problem because mostly he's looking at interactions uh, within groups and between group interactions are much more complex and and mm -hmm. hard to surmount. Uh, but could uh, you know bonobos could do it almost for sure. They haven't done that particular experiment, but could chimpanzees, given enough stress uh, and the uh, possibility of resolving a problem by working together, could they ever do that? Great experiment. So are you working on a, uh, towards a, a second PhD in anthropology? I think this could be your big, uh, big move. You know, I, I believe that thus far, we've all been talking about descriptive research, like just looking at animals out in the wild and try to explain what they're doing. But where do these sort of experimental interventions come into your line of work? Oh, I don't really do experimental interventions. I'm out there watching animals and just seeing how uh, those societies come together and function. I'm trying mm -hmm. to get the basics of how societies work in the world uh, down. Uh, one of the things, for example, that said often is that uh, by anthropologists is that societies must require a big brain, but clearly they don't because uh, ants don't need big brains and they basically do all kinds of things that chimpanzees can't. In fact, chimpanzees, well, certain ants are much more like humans than any chimpanzee. If a chimpanzee, mm -hmm. if you put the, all the behavior of a chimpanzee into something like a mouse, and you had a mouse that did be chimpanzee behavior and you came across it, you would not think much about it being like a human. They're just kind of bizarre. They don't have pair bonds. They're forcing sex on each other. They're, there are all kinds of weird things going on. They certainly aren't building infrastructure, showing complex division of labor. The things that we think about in the day to day and see around us in a place like New York, these are ant things. So mm -hmm. people will tell me, uh, comparing ants and humans just seems wrong. And I actually wrote a paper called Apples and Oranges, Ants and Humans, The Misunderstood Art of Making Comparisons, where I point out that comparing things that are identical is really boring. Comparisons only become interesting when they're between things that we don't think of as being alike. And that's where ants become really fascinating. That's where they give us the opportunities. Chimpanzees to me are 
are only minimal, uh, minimally human-like in their uh, god-awful complexity of social interactions over all kinds of things that don't get any jobs done. You know, the, the mess of hierarchies and, and back and forth within chimpanzees doesn't lead to the end, end of the day to them building a structure to live in. Would you say that there are universal natural law type things that describe social behavior that generalize across species, like in, in the same way that you have universal laws in physics? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. Or at least I haven't found them yet. No, I mm -hmm. can't help you with that one. Right, because I'm, I'm wondering if it's fundamentally the same game we're playing, but the, the things that you just vary are like the body's type and size and intelligence and the environment and all these things, or if, well, that's kind of everything that you'd be very. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, this whole sense of, uh, uh, you, how much should an individual body have in it to make an effective unit? We talk about uh, complexity a lot and humans have very large brains. Ants have smaller brains. Our brains, uh, each neuron is a separate unit. So how many, if we take all our, the neurons in a human brain and divide them into units of 250,000, you end up with about the number of ants in an army ant colony. Same number of mm -hmm. neurons distributed now into smaller units. And uh, how much can they get done? How effectively can they work with the same brain power? To me, the, uh, I'm just free roaming here, but to me, the, uh, the interesting superhero that Marvel Comics has not invented is not Ant-Man, who's a complete bore. He's simply small and rides in the back yeah. of a queen ant that flies. There's nothing going on. The superhero would be me walking along, starving because there's no food, trying to figure out what's happening in the world, and my body being able to dissolve into millions of individual ants sized things that sweep through the world, find every bit of nutrients on the ground, come back well fed with all kinds of information that they've gathered from the environment and recreate me right. again at the end. And so, each little bit can carry like many times your own body weight, right? That's right. So if you want to uh, have, uh, if you want to have a pet that can carry a potato chip across the living room and put it in your hand, an ant is your your pet. So in any case, that's, you know, how do we divide up those neurons and how do they orchestrate what they're doing? Ants provide kind of an intermediate step between mm -hmm. having solitary neurons and having a huge brain. And their way of getting things done is actually uh, quite effective because they control the environment at our feet, right? They, they absolutely do. We do not appreciate how much they do. And, uh, you know, they're constantly uh, gathering information and doing things right without having a leader and with everybody doing a little bit of a job in the right way. And uh, ant, a super intelligent ant would say, why the heck do humans, first of all, have all this bizarre stuff with hierarchies and dominance displays and like all this uh, rituals and all these things that don't actually get the highway built and why do they have leaders because can't you just drop a bomb in the white house and, and just wipe out the country's ability to do anything so ants you know have this kind of distributed way of doing things where every ant has a certain amount of information they gather ants uh, information from, from the ants that pass by pick their job for the day in a way that makes sense and the colony as a whole moves forward and accomplishes things and makes the right decision without anyone having oversight on anything. We're talking about a hive mind, which is an idea I know from popular culture, but is, is that the scientific term for it? Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a popular name in the science literature too. Mm -hmm. What, can, can we talk more about that? How, how, are there, are there predictions you can make about hive mind behaviors, like in, in terms of evolutionary pressures in the same way that you can make that about, uh, like individual psychology of animals? Well, the, I'm not sure about predictions, but there, there are some interesting things going on. Of course, once you have 
uh, not just one big brain, which you can uh, shoot and destroy the whole uh, sh uh, shebang, me, and I'm, I'm gone forever, but like millions of ants with the same number of neurons, you can uh, have all kinds of uh, division of labor and other things, and also personality among the ants. So ants have a lot of differences in personality, and that may contribute to the function of the society. But emerging from that, you have personality among amongst colonies. You're going to have colonies that are more aggressive or are better at finding certain food. Uh, through the ants, individuals practice of all these ants and doing certain things, perhaps. So certain colonies become very good at uh, and migrating or moving when there's a disturbance of their nest uh, and through practice. So when you see the whole colony, it acts basically as a functional unit, but as a different kind of unit than it might have been if it had been trained in a different way earlier on. So it's actually acting like a personality. And that, to me, at least is fascinating. We kind of do that with large scale human societies. We personify large groups like nations will say, the United States is angry at Russia as if they're two individuals. Yeah, and we can say that uh, we can uh, make simplified statements and say the French are this way and the Italians are that way. And there may be an element of uh, truth to that. There can be differences in the emergent person personalities as it were, were of a nation, even though it's unfair to describe the individual uh, individual citizens as such. So uh -huh. we do kind of simplify things in a way that uh, is useful information. So the San, the Bushmen were called the peaceful people. And for the most part, compared to a lot of societies, they were very non-aggressive and so forth. So, yeah. So it's clearly at least a linguistic thing, but then there's the, the broader socio-biological question of, are, the, are we operating like a hive mind? Like, uh, you know, in social psychology, you talk about um, how these these crowd effects can kind of take over. Yeah, no, it's, uh, well, it, definitely people should be studying ants for that. Uh -huh. Let's talk about your most recent book, The Human Swarm. So swarm, at least if you're not an entomologist, seems to have negative connotations. I don't know if you mean that, though. Well, in fact, the... Uh, the title was decided on by the publisher because they wanted the word human in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm sort of uh, have mixed feeling about the word swarm, uh, indeed. Uh, but basically, the idea here is uh, one we touched on in a couple spots, and that is that humans have this capacity to have large societies. And a reason mm -hmm for that and move through swarms. Okay, talk about it in, in New York terms, swarms. We, we use the word swarm around here, there's no problem in New York. But, uh, and the fact that we came from ancestors that didn't live in large societies. And the interesting thing to me was the realization early on when I started thinking about societies, because I've lived with hunter-gatherer groups and tribal groups, I, I do a lot of work in the tropics, uh, that 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 most species of vertebrates have a completely different way of forming societies in terms of identity. And that's shown by entering something called a Starbucks. I don't know if you've ever heard of these things. They're in one right today. everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's bizarre because you can walk into these things and walk past all these people and go over and buy a beverage without wanting to kill everybody or run away with in terror because that would be impossible for a chimpanzee. A chimpanzee cannot enter a room or a bit of forest in the case of an actual chimpanzee uh, where other chimpanzees that don't know are living without having a heart attack. A chimpanzee literally has to know every other chimpanzee it meets. And I call societies like that individual recognition societies because there has to be a all-inclusive knowledge of everybody in the society. And mm -hmm. chimpanzees and bonobos have that sort of society and most other vertebrates do as well. And perhaps because of cognitive limitations, just because it takes some brain power to even recognize all these individuals, these societies 
are always small. A few dozen individuals is pretty normal, like a lion pride or a wolf pack and so forth. Um, humans made a dramatic shift uh, by transforming to what I call an anonymous societies. And those are societies that where we don't have to know every individual because we can uh, home in on some kind of cues that indicate that they belong with us, that we're comfortable with them in that room. And those cues I mentioned before are all over our bodies. They include all kinds of very obvious things, uh, including how we uh, dress and you know act like an American, for example. But uh, mm -hmm. one of my favorite researchers is Abigail Marsh, and uh, she showed a couple of very subtle cues also exist. For example, you can look uh, at someone at a distance and and almost guess for sure guess right whether they're American or Australian by how they walk or wait or raise their hand and nobody knows that they can do this interesting and nobody can tell you why when they get it right so the point is that these aren't all just big cultural things these are things that we're taking in all the time another one of my favorite studies of hers was uh she shows images of an Asian face with a neutral expression, nobody can guess anything about that face. But if they smile or frown, people almost always figure out whether they're American or not. They can guess that. And so these emotions are universal, right? They're mm -hmm. present around the world, but the individual muscles we use might be different from culture to culture and society to society. So these kinds of things, don't just include the big things like rituals and language that we mostly focus in on when we're talking about societies, big uh -huh. cultural things that we learned. They're built into us all over the place. We can tell whether someone we're comfortable with someone before they say a word. Uh -huh. So on one hand, we're able to do this. And on the other hand, you mentioned an early historical example of Europeans first contact with, with uh, certain native tribes and they didn't view them as humans, but, and and I don't know if I'm just too biased by a modern perspective, but it seems like you would, you would very clearly recognize that even if the skin color is different and other things are different, like we have, we look much more similar to each other than any other species. What do you, so how do you reconcile those two? Well, there's a sense in which we treat the characteristics of our society as if they were species level differences when we categorize things in the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, this idea that there's a, a natural essence inside. And so when you have a person that dresses like someone from Iran or and talks and so forth, like someone from Iran, we see them as a different species. And Basically, these are markers, I call them markers or signals that we broadcast in a way to establish ourselves as genuine human beings. Mm -hmm. I'm walking like an American. We don't even know we're doing it, but you know, all these things are being broadcast to each other. And uh, we treat them as if they were characteristics like the giant ears and trunk of an elephant. We treat them as fundamental things with an inner essence, and we divide up the world into different human groups that way. Uh, that's not necessarily negative, as, to, as long as we don't put much baggage on it in terms of negative uh, beliefs about each other. And the trouble is we tend to add those beliefs, so it becomes very tricky. So generally, you define species by can, this, can they mate with each other? And if the answer is no, it's a different species. And if the answer is yes, it's the same species. But there are a handful of examples like lions and tigers or even humans and Neanderthals where we can mate with each other, but we consider those different species. Right. And, uh, you know, when you show a uh, picture of a intergrade between a, a lion and a tiger to a child, it tends to put them in one category or another. We still tend mm -hmm. to categorize things when we show an image of someone with dark skin, uh, we can categorize them as black if we add things like an Afro and so forth. So we're looking at these all these ensemble of characteristics, or we can 
might put them into the white category, the Caucasian category, if we give them uh, attributes that we think of belonging to Caucasian. So we use these, all these signals, this billboard of our identity to put people into distinct categories. There's very, uh, our brains do this automatically, and there's very little that's left in the middle when we've done it. Mm -hmm. It, and this, it clearly does all seem to be a result of social learning, because if you think about the, the human species from an evolutionary perspective, we all originated in a small subset of Africa, and then a subset of that original population migrated out and like, uh, became all, all of the different races that we have now. So I, I learned that there's more genetic diversity within Africans than uh, all, between all other human races, and, and that's because of the that stemming from an original subset of Africans. Yes. Well, I think, I think our response to races was preceded by our responses to ethnic differences. Because if mm -hmm. you go back and you look at uh, hunter gatherers around the world, they had ethnic gr differences from group to group, and they would see each other's belonging or not based on those. Mm -hmm. So if you add to that a skin difference or something obvious, that becomes something easy to, to home in on, right? So that would have come along somewhat later. Uh, so we would have all already had those kinds of distinctions in mind just on everyday differences from one society to the next, one ethnic group. Uh, I wouldn't call them ethnic groups until they become part of it within a society, but one society to the next. And uh, the thing is though, but just as you say, there's more genetic diversity in Africa than anywhere else in the world. So. Uh, some people like to think that races are a modern uh, fiction, and they are a fiction in terms of biology because there is a uh, continuum around the world. But in fact, people migrate and have migrated long distances for a long time. So early Africans would have seen uh, people from other parts of Africa who had traveled from a, quite a distance and looked distinctive. And they would have mm -hmm. seen them and treated them as distinctive. They wouldn't have had the word for race yet. Mm -hmm. And if they had traveled to where those people were from and seen the population along the way, they'd realize it was a continuum and there's no real race there. But what they see is something different. And, you know, that's the true of today when you uh, look at groups that have migrated long distances to different places. This, uh, this, uh, there are uh, breaks in this continuity just because of the way people have have uh, migrated and that leads us to perceive these kinds of groups. And we do it, the, the thing is we do it, it's not just social learning because we do it before we can, we're taught, you know, an infant mm -hmm. figures out uh, the ethnic background of the individuals he or she is looking at, the little baby before it knows language and is responding more to those of its caretaker or mother or father than it is to other groups, more positive. Yeah. Although, I, although I think, I like that you bring the, the child development perspective in it, because if you're thinking about historical hunter gatherers, they're probably growing up with the same people in the same place and you don't have much outside exposure. But then modern children, at least if you're living in a diverse area, can will, will just be exposed to a lot of human diversity. Although even then, with the early biases that you mentioned, it, it seems like you could pin it to social learning if if you just add very heavy weight to learning of the the child's caregivers and immediate environment. But I think I think there's some research that children who grow up in um, biracial parent households exhibit less of that bias. Yeah, they, they certainly do. There are all kinds of ways around it. But even hunter gatherers in small groups would have seen neighboring groups that would have uh, taken pride in distinguishing themselves uh, through their hairstyle. Hairstyle is much more important for hunter-gatherers than it is today. Within uh, societies today, we have a lot of individual tastes and hairstyle, but one of the one, th uh, just to bring up hairstyle, uh, one of the things that has fascinated me is that humans don't just need to groom each other like chimpanzees, we style each other around mm -hmm. the world everybody does that so we have this unmanageable hair uh -huh. so we don't know when we first started to get this kind of hair but whenever it was it was probably evolved as a s ways of signaling who we were originally so you have you know in recent times groups like the mohawks and all kinds of uh, uh different uh society related differences tribal differences uh, i went to 
Africa once with a book that showed different African tribes and photographs and I showed it to some people in Cameroon. And the first thing they looked at was like, look at these strange people, it's their hair. And they kept pointing to the hair. And we're like, wow, mm -hmm. hair is really important. I hadn't thought of that before. So we have that and we have all these other signals that would have varied even back then and have been important to people even within neighboring groups. So children presumably as well would have homed in on that and maybe even before they learn language, depending on how mm -hmm. their parents, how much their parents were carrying them around. That's interesting. I've, I've thought about the evolution of hair from a sexual selection perspective, but not from a cultural selection perspective. You're, you're talking as a guy with really good hair. I can see that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, Thank I'm you. jealous. Yeah. Okay, never mind. So when we when we talk about these social conformity biases, like you know people wanting to dress the same way to show that you're normal and that you can go to a Starbucks without uh, any any conflict like a chimp might have, at the same time there seems to be another pressure where you standing out amongst the crowd, like some if someone has a, a really flamboyant outfit, you might think, wow, I wish I was as confident as that person. They must be super cool. So you have you have these seemingly conflicting motives of like on one hand conformity good on the other hand non-conformity good yeah you definitely do and and that's something that uh, actually becomes uh, a society level trait in a place like america where one of the features of america one of the identifying traits is everybody is different it's like one of the things that we take pride pride in right so mm -hmm. we allow all sorts of uh, non-conformists, at least when things are good. I mean, in times of war, or stress, and so forth, those people can get in trouble if they're expressing themselves in ways we don't like. But on, on good days, you know, this diversity becomes an identifying trait. And I think it's true for people uh, thinking of Americans around the world. And the more conformist societies like China ex have a certain expectation of how people should dress. And sometimes that can be forced on them, but it's often just a, you know, an expectation, a norm. Mark, we've covered a lot of territory from apples to oranges, from humans to ants. Is there anything else that you want to share with our audience before we wrap up? Okay, well, uh, ants are cool. Get out in the backyard, get down on your hands and knees, join your one-year-old and think about how societies work and the complexity that can emerge even in the very world of the very, very small. So I think uh, uh, even, even anthropologists and psychologists can gain from a little time with the ants. That's all I'll say at the moment. Thanks, Adam. Thank you so much, Mark, for sharing your wisdom and passion with us. Appreciate it.